Section 26 of the Essays of Samuel Johnson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. The Essays of Samuel Johnson. Section 26. The Voyage of Life. Ipsa cuque assidu labuntur tempora moto, no sicus ac flumen, necu enim consistere flumen, nec levi hora pote, sed u unda impellitur onda, orgeturque prior veniente, orgetque priorem, tempora sic fugiant, Pariter, pariterque sequentur, Ovid. With constant motion as the moments glide, Behold in running life the rolling tide, For none can stem by art or stop by power, The flowing ocean or the fleeting hour, But wave by wave pursued arrives on shore, And each impelled behind impels before. So time on time revolving we descry, so minutes follow, and so minutes fly. Elphinstone Life, says Seneca, is a voyage in the progress of which we are perpetually changing our scenes. We first leave childhood behind us, then youth, then the years of ripened manhood, then the better and more pleasing part of old age. The perusal of this passage having incited in me a train of reflections on the state of man, the incessant fluctuation of his wishes, the gradual change of his disposition to all external objects, and the thoughtlessness with which he floats along the stream of time, I sunk into a slumber amidst my meditations, and on a sudden found my ears filled with the tumult of labour, the shouts of lacrosity, the shrieks of alarm, the whistle of winds, and the dash of waters. My astonishment for a time repressed my curiosity, but soon recovering myself so far as to inquire whither we were going, and what was the cause of such clamour and confusion, I was told that we were launching out into the ocean of life, that we had already passed the straits of infancy in which multitudes had perished some by the weakness and fragility of their vessels, and more by the folly, perverseness, or negligence of those who undertook to steer them, and that we were now on the main sea, abandoned to the winds and billows, without any other means of security than the care of the pilot, whom it was always in our power to choose among great numbers that offered their direction and assistance. I then looked round with anxious eagerness, and first turning my eyes behind me, saw a stream flowing through flowery islands, which every one that sailed along seemed to behold with pleasure. But no sooner touched than the current, which though not noisy or turbulent, was yet irresistible, bore him away. Beyond these islands all was darkness, nor could any of the passengers describe the shore at which he first embarked. Before me and on each side was an expanse of waters violently agitated and covered with so thick a mist that the most perspicacious eye could see but a little way. It appeared to be full of rocks and whirlpools, for many sunk unexpectedly while they were courting the gale with full sails and insulting those whom they had left behind. So numerous indeed were the dangers and so thick the darkness that no caution could confer security. Yet there were many who, by false intelligence, betrayed their followers into whirlpools, or by violence pushed those whom they found in their way against the rocks. The current was invariable and insurmountable, but, though it was impossible to sail against it, or to return to the place that was once passed, yet it was not so violent as to allow no opportunities for dexterity or courage, since, though none could retreat back from danger, yet they might often avoid it by oblique direction. It was, however, 
not very common to steer with much care or prudence for by some universal infatuation every man appeared to think himself safe though he saw his consorts every moment sinking around him and no sooner had the waves closed over them than their fate and their misconduct were forgotten the voyage was pursued with the same jocund confidence every man congratulated himself upon the soundness of his vessel and believed himself able to stem the whirlpool in which his friend was swallowed or glide over the rocks on which he was dashed nor was it often observed that the sight of a wreck made any man change his course if he turned aside for a moment he soon forgot the rudder and left himself again at the disposal of chance this negligence did not proceed from indifference nor from weariness of their present condition for not one of those who thus rushed upon destruction failed when he was sinking to call loudly upon his associates for that help which could not now be given him and many spent their last moments in cautioning others against the folly by which they were intercepted in the midst of their course their benevolence was sometimes praised but their admonitions were unregarded the vessels in which we had embarked being confessedly unequal to the turbulence of the stream of life were visibly impaired in the course of the voyage so that every passenger was certain that how long soever he might by favourable accident or by incessant vigilance be preserved he must sink at last this necessity of perishing might have been expected to sadden the gay and intimidate the daring at least to keep the melancholy and timorous in perpetual torments and hinder them from any enjoyments of the varieties and gratifications which nature offered them as the solace of their labours yet in effect none seemed less to expect destruction than those to whom it was most dreadful they all had the art of concealing their danger from themselves and those who knew their inability to bear the sight of the terrors that embarrassed their way took care never to look forward but found some amusement for the present moment and generally entertained themselves by playing with hope who was the constant associate of life yet all that hope ventured to promise even to those whom she favoured most was not that they should escape but that they should sink last and with this promise every one was satisfied though he laughed at the rest for seeming to believe it hope indeed apparently mocked the credulity of her companions for in proportion as their vessels grew leaky she redoubled her assurance of safety and none were more busy in making provisions for a long voyage than they whom all but themselves saw likely to perish soon by irreparable decay in the midst of the current of life was the gulf of intemperance a dreadful whirlpool interspersed with rocks of which the pointed crags were concealed under water and the tops covered with herbage on which ease spread couches of repose and with shades where pleasure warbled the song of invitation within sight of these rocks all who sailed on the ocean of life must necessarily pass reason indeed was always at hand to steer the passengers through a narrow outlet by which they might escape but very few could by her entreaties or remonstrances be induced to put the rudder into her hand without stipulating that she should approach so near unto the rocks of pleasure that they might solace themselves with a short enjoyment of that delicious region after which they always determined to pursue their course without any other deviation reason was too often prevailed upon so far by these promises as to venture her charge within the eddy of the gulf of intemperance where indeed the circumvolution was weak but yet interrupted the course of the vessel and drew it by insensible rotations towards the centre she then repented her temerity and with all her force endeavoured to retreat but the draught of the gulf was generally too strong to be overcome and the passenger having danced in circles with a pleasing and giddy velocity was at last overwhelmed and lost those few whom reason was able to extricate generally suffered so many shocks upon the points which shot out from the rocks of pleasure 
that they were unable to continue their course with the same strength and facility as before but floated along timorously and feebly endangered by every breeze and shattered by every ruffle of the water till they sunk by slow degrees after long struggles the innumerable expedients always repining at their own folly and warning others against the first approach of the gulf of intemperance there were artists who professed to repair the breaches and stop the leaks of the vessels which had been shattered on the rocks of pleasure many appeared to have great confidence in their skill and some indeed were preserved by it from sinking who had received only a single blow but i remarked that few vessels lasted long which had been much repaired nor was it found that the artists themselves continued afloat longer than those who had least of their assistance the only advantage which in the voyage of life the cautious had above the negligent was that they sunk later and more suddenly for they passed forward till they had sometimes seen all those in whose company they had issued from the straits of infancy perish in that way and at last were overset by a cross breeze without the toil of resistance or the anguish of expectations but such as had often fallen against the rocks of pleasure commonly subsided by sensible degrees contented long with the encroaching waters and harassed themselves by labours that scarce hope herself could flatter with success as i was looking upon the various fate of the multitude about me i was suddenly alarmed with an admonition from some unknown power gaze not idly upon others when thou thyself art sinking whence is this thoughtless tranquillity when thou and they are equally endangered i looked and seeing the gulf of intemperance before me started and awaked end of section 26